Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm happy that you're able to make it this evening. Especially, I'm happy that my friend from work, Maisha, was able to come and join us. Um, as you, I know most of you, you know, I, I'm a registered nurse. I work in Roanoke Memorial Hospital, and I'm also a nurse practitioner school. Recently, I began my clinicals, actually, last week. And I'm driving all the way to Waynesboro, which is close, close to UVA, close to uh, Charlottesville. So, and plus still I'm doing school, so this lecture about stress, I need it myself. <laughs> I was saying, you know, I was telling my mom, I was like, I need someone to give me this lecture. <laughs> but, you know, it's good preparing it, and I'm happy that I'm able to do it this evening. Because when you give a lecture or do a sermon or something, you know, you grow and learn from it yourself. So how many of us have stress? Everybody, Everybody right? If we don't have stress now, we have had stress in the past. And uh, are we able to cope with it? Are we able to deal with it? Um, what do you, can you guess some of the statistics of stress in the United States? How many people do you think experience symptoms of stress, like negative effects of stress? 100 percent. That's close, 77 percent. 77 percent experience symptoms of stress. How many people do you think lie awake at night and can't sleep because of stress? 25 percent? 50%, 75%, about 50%. About half the people in the US can't sleep at night because of stress. And um, about 33% of people have extreme stress, severe, severe stress. The interesting thing is that each generation it gets worse. So the people that were born in the 80s, it was, it was bad. But then the people that were born in the 90s, it was worse. The millennials, for them, their stress is worse. So as, we, as each generation comes, it gets worse. Today, we're going to discuss a few main points. Number one, how can we better understand stress? Number two, what are some of the sources of stress? What causes stress? Number three, how does stress affect your health? We know it can be bad for your health, but also it can be good. And number four, we're going to look at some practical ways to reduce, decrease, and manage stress. So what is stress? Stress is defined as the body's response to any demand made upon it. So if you're sick, if you have health problems, if you aren't sleeping, if you're worrying, if you have a new job, if you are in debt, these are all causes of stress. These are all termed stressors. So demands, events, situations are stressors, things that cause stress. The general wear and tear of daily living is also stress. Now let's try to understand stress. The interesting thing about stress is it's additive. Let's say, for example, that um, you're buying a new house. That's a stressful thing, right? And then at the same time, your father or your mother or your grandparent passes away. And then at the same time, you're getting a new job or you just lost your job. Those are all things. You have one stressor, then you added another stressor and another stressor. The stress adds up. So the body's response to stress is the sum of all the stressful situations that it's exposed to. But the goal is you want to try to keep stress within manageable limits and use it to your advantage. Actually, we're going to see a little further on that stress can be to your advantage. And stress is subjective. For, for example, for me, um, you know, it can be very stressful to buy a new house. For someone else, it can be different. It's subjective. It's, it's, it depends on the person, how stress is to them. And uh, stress occurs within us. It's our reaction to perceived threats, to challenges, to required changes. Everyone manages it differently. So whether stress gets us down or not is how we handle stress and how we adapt to it, how we deal with that stress. So what are some main causes of stress? Daily hassles, change. We see stress can come from a variety of sources. You know, environment, finances, relationship problems, conflicts. What causes you the most stress? What causes me the most stress? That's some of the things we want to look at tonight and see how we can negate that. There's other stressful life events. Um, stressful life events are one of the major, major causes of stress. It's a death of a close family member, um, major change in finances, a loss of a job, buying a new house, marriage, divorce. Becoming a parent, 
as you see, some of these things are good things, right? Getting a new house, getting a new job, becoming a parent, those are good things. But sometimes when you have too many good stressors, that can cause negative effects. So let's look at the two types of stress. There's two types of stress. You have your you stress. You basically means good or beneficial stress or well. So good stress is you stress. And then bad stress is distress. So a good stress is something that causes you to do, to do better, to perform higher, to function at a higher level, while distress or negative stress, it basically destroys your mental health, your physical health. And um, let's take a look here at you stress. What is you stress? A lot of students experience you stress. This is a stress that motivates them to you know, go to school, go to college, get a degree, graduate, study for their tests. You know, they think, okay, I have a test next week. I better study, right? That's you stress. That's good stress. Um, even like we mentioned earlier, there's other types of good stressors. And these types of stresses lead to increased productivity, increased functioning. But the problem is, as I mentioned, some of this or too much good stress over a long period of time can be bad. You know, for example, when I first started college, if I had a paper or an exam or something to study for, I could stay up till 3 a.m. I could stay up all night sometimes and just study and do that paper and then, you know, knock it out in the morning. And then as I get older, and over years and years, I've been in school for almost eight years, um, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I can't even, it's hard to even stay up till midnight sometimes studying. It's not... Not that I can't necessarily stay up, but I just don't want to deal with it. I've done it so many times. So even the repeated good stress can be bad. Um, let's look at here at the stress model. Here you have different types of um, stresses like conflicts, changes, work demands, a personal loss. And when you have a stressor, that leads to your response. Your response depends on your your, your genes, your personal previous experiences, your attitude, your self-image, and then your response leads to how you cope with it, how you deal with it. Do you get help? Do you talk it out? Do you plan it out? Do you make a schedule? Do you organize your day, or do you just get frustrated, and you just get discouraged, and you just go lock yourself in your room because say, I can't deal with this, I can't deal with this. So as you see here on the top, you can have a good benefit of stress, and on the bottom, you can have the ne negative benefit, or not benefit, you can have the negative result, the effect. So what we want to do is we want to balance. We want to have that good stress, and then if, if something happens, if a stressor happens in our lives to cause us distress, we want to negate that. So we're going to see how we can do that further on. And, um, you know, a person may say, for example, let's say someone has a new work demand or a new deadline, a new project they have to do for work. A person can say, you know, this is in unreasonable. This is impossible. There's no way I can do this by Friday. That's someone showing distress. But on, on the other hand, a person saying, showing you stress would say, OK, you know, I've done this before. This is going to be difficult, but I can get it done. Let me ask my advisor. Let me get some help on this. Or let me even talk to my boss and see if I can extend the deadline till Monday. So the person that has the you stress there being productive, and they're figuring out how to deal with it. Um, let's do a little, little quiz here on stress signals, how many stress signals that you ha have. So just keep a, keep a little tally to yourself. Hopefully, you won't have too many. Um, do you have minor problems that can seem overwhelming? Do minor problems seem overwhelming to you? Do you say, I feel nervous. I worry about many things. Honestly, these first two probably can be a lot of us here. Do you say, I can't stop thinking about my problems? Do you feel frustrated or angry much of the time? Do you feel tense much of the time? Do you find that it's sometimes hard to go to sleep because maybe you're thinking about things over and over? Do you feel tired and have little energy? I don't know how many of, how many of those you have, as positives, but if you have two or more, that's not good. That shows that you may have a stress problem. 
So basically what you need to do then is take action to see how to reduce that stress load and improve your coping or your, the way that you deal with it. Now how does stress affect your health? Stress has many, many, many negative effects on the health. It not only causes you symptoms that you can feel and see right away pretty frequently, but it can cause you actual illnesses. Um, high levels of unresolved stress can cause a variety of physical and mental symptoms. And eventually, if they're not dealt with early, they can cause disease. For example, you know, some people from, from stress, they can get stomach ulcers, they can get GERD. Others can get you know, cancer, hypertension, heart problems. You know, you can be, you can have headaches, backaches, problems sleeping, fatigue. So basically, when you see these symptoms, these symptoms are warning signs. If you start having these symptoms, you should be like, okay, wow, maybe I'm, you know, overdoing it here. Maybe I need to take a break. Maybe I need to see what I can do to deal with my stress. You just don't hope they go away. Or you, let's say you have sleeping problems. You just don't want to take some sleeping pills or... If you have fatigue, you just don't want to you know, get a double shot of coffee the next morning over and over again. You want to see what you can do to deal with it. Um, some of the stress-related illnesses are frequent colds or flus. When you're stressed, your immune system goes down and your body is not able to react to, you know, to viruses, to pathogens, even to allergens. For example, if you're stressed, if you're sleep deprived and you go outside and it's you know, you, you, you can get allergies much easier. You can have an upset stomach. Your food is not going to digest as it normally does. Depression, heart disease, stroke. We're going to talk about some of these here today. And the first um, stress-related illness that I want to talk about is heart disease. This um, inter-heart study was an international study that's a huge study. It was done over in, in 52 countries on 25,000 people, on around 25,000 people. So it's not just in America, not just in developed countries. It was in 52 countries, and they found that stress is a big, uh, significant risk factor for heart disease. And we'll look at um, some of the results here in a second. Basically, what stress does is it damages your arteries and it damages your heart, which leads to heart disease and heart attacks. So. Stress in all types of forms contri contri contributes to 33% of all heart attacks. So about one-third of heart attacks in some way or another are related to stress. Stress at home and work. People that had stress at home and or work were 45% more likely to have a heart attack than those with infrequent periods of stress. And then people with continual stress were twice as likely to have a heart attack. And um, another study that I was looking at on heart attacks, it showed that people that, it, it talked about people in, with worry and anxiety. And it's, the study found that people with a high worry score had a 70% higher risk of heart attack and people with a very, very high worry score had a 154% increased risk of heart attack. So worry, stress leads to heart attack or, and heart disease. Um, also, it can lead to high blood pressure. This study here talks about people who were anxious, uptight, unhappy, or depressed. And they were twice as likely to develop high blood pressure in the next nine years compared to the people who didn't have those symptoms. So this is important of um, dealing with those feelings. You don't want to just let them continue if you have anxiety, if you have stress, depression. You want to learn ways to cope with and deal with those problems. Now, does stress, can it affect your mortality? Can it affect how long you live? Yes, it can. Um, a study here on about 1,500 middle-aged men observed them for over 18 years, and it had three groups of men, men with low stress, men with moderate stress, and then men with high stress. And this um, analyzed them based on the number of stressful life events that they had. So over those men that were observed over 18 years, this is a long study, 
These men were tested every year, every year for 18 years. And what did it find? Let's look here at the results. The persons with moderate or high levels of stress continually over the 18 years were 37 to 42 percent more likely to die than those who had low stress levels. So you're more likely to die, you're at increased risk for early death. Now, what are some ways to improve mortality? What are some ways to lengthen life, to counteract the stress cause, uh, the effects of stress? It's interesting here that it says people who dealt best with high or moderate stress and had low mortal mortality rates were married. So people were, that were married, people that had a good social support system, and people that had good overall health. Um, now, these people, when they were asked, how they considered their health. They said, how do, you think that, how do you think your health is? What do you think their response was? Good. Excellent. They said, I think I have excellent health. So, you know, you think better about yourself. You have a higher self-esteem. Now, how can we deal with stress? We've been talking about all the bad things that stress causes. We, we said that also stress can have good effects, but how can we deal with the negative effects of stress? Let's look at some ways. One way is you can take pills. You can see that sometimes at work we give a lot of pills to people. Maisha would know, but I've never given that, given that many at once. But we'll, sometimes some people will have you know, 10, 11, 15, 16 at one time, a big handful. And, and uh, do pills work for stress, for anxiety? Not everybody. And they, if they work, they may work for a little bit. For example, yes. For example, some people, you know, we have some patients that are just really, really antsy and they want to get out of bed and they're a fall risk or they're anxious, anxious. And, you know, we give them some, something to, some anti-anxiety medicine like an Ativan or a Valium or something like that. And it works, right? It may work for six hours, for eight hours, for four hours. But what happens? Once the medicine wears off, you've got to call the doctor. Oh, I need another, I need something else. You know, that's not enough. So it doesn't deal with the cause of the stress. What it does is it helps you know, the, the current problem, the symptoms, exactly. Thank you. You know, Sometimes we have some patients that are just super, super anxious, and they're on the ventilator, and they're <sighs> and you have to give them something to calm them down. But as soon as that medicine wears off, that's it. They're back. <laughs> so instead of giving something to deal with the symptoms, we want to find something. We want to find something to help resolve the stress to help deal with the problem. So how can you manage and reduce stress? Before we talk about managing and reducing stress, I want to talk about something that's called resilience. You see here this flower that grew in the middle of the parched desert or the parched ground? You know, the, the ground might have been dried up, there might have been no rain, but when the rain came, that flower was resilient, that seed was resilient, it came back. Resilience is a good way to deal with stress. It's the ability the ability to bounce back. We all are faced with stress. We all have major life events, major problems. But how do we bounce back from them? Have you ever seen a tree that was cut? And uh, you cut the tree, and you leave the stump, and then like six months later or a year later, you have some shoots coming in the sides? <laughs> that the tree is bouncing back. It's coming back, right? That's a resilient tree. Or you're trying to uproot some weed or some bush from your garden, and you're hoeing it out, and then the next year it comes back. That's resilient. We need to be like that too. We're going to all be faced with st stressors and difficulties, but we've got to bounce back. So resilience is one of the best ways to deal with stress. And um, one of the best ways to cope and react to it. So let's talk about learning to cope or learning to deal with stress. Stress, as I mentioned, is unavoidable. So we've got to learn how to deal with it or how to cope with it. It's, it's essential for good health. We don't want to cope in a negative way. We can cope in a negative way just to get by, but we're going to have negative effects. So as we mentioned, we want to have strong family support systems, strong friend, uh, support systems of friends, and we want to learn how to improve our overall health. Now let's look at some negative approaches of dealing with stress. These are some common ones that people do. 
They can be in denial. You can take drugs, sleeping pills, anti-anxiety meds. All of this, staying up late, wasting time, overeating, binge eating. Have you ever come home from a busy day at work and you're not hungry, but you just have to eat something? Or you came home and you just want to have, you just got to have some ice cream or some pizza or just some <laughs> chips or some french fries or some comfort food, right? And then you're eating and eating sometimes and you're not, you're not eating because you're hungry, but you're just stressed. You've got to just eat some more. You know, sometimes that might work and help with your stress temporarily, but that's not a good way to deal with it. Um, you know, some of these common techniques have negative effects in the long run. They can lead to, you know, many negative, many negative effects. But it might seem to work temporarily, but it doesn't work in the long run. So let's say you're in denial. Let's say you have a big assignment due. You can just say, oh, let me not worry about it. Let me just think about something else and just leave it, leave it, leave it till the end instead of just dealing with it and, you know, figuring out when you're going to do it, coming up with a schedule. Now let's look at some positive ways to cope and deal with stress. One of the biggest things is time management. Time management is critical. It's so important. You know, you've got to set a schedule. You've got to put down priorities, see what, you know, what is the most important thing that I need to do today? What do I need to do tomorrow? Just focus one day at a time. Take responsibility, control, learn to delegate. Sometimes we don't like to delegate. Some of us like to do, just do everything all ourselves, right? But if you get to a point where it's too much for you to do all at once, or if you're going to just be over, over stressed, you've got to delegate. You know, sometimes at work I'm charge nurse, and uh, the day might be very busy. As charge nurse, you have to do a few extra things. But I've learned doing that to delegate, to say, you know, hey, can you please help me with this so I can catch up on charting? Can you please you know, call this person for me. Can you please do this? And it helps. It really helps. You want to balance your stress with relaxation response. Get adequate rest, get regular meals, physical activity, and strengthen your support system. So I want to go over seven ways to beat stress before it beats you. And one of the best ways to deal with stress is to relax, is to laugh. So to laugh, I want to go over a I'm just going to say a couple kind of jokes about stress. So what's the advantage to stress? One of the good advantages to stress is you never have to make your bed because you're always in it. <laughs> what is stress? Stress is when you wake up screaming and you realize you haven't fallen asleep yet. <laughs> if you know someone is stressed out, be sure to tell them they need to relax. You'd be surprised how many people haven't thought of that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, a, a friend said, you look stressed. I told him, yeah, it's the stress. <laughs> so what are seven ways to beat stress before it beats you? Let's take a look. The following are practical suggestions that can help me and you combat the daily and negative effects of stress. You know, when I was going over this study, I was shocked. I, I thought there would be like 10 things you could you know, do to overcome stress, to deal with stress. But, but actually, there was like 20, 25 things, excellent ways to deal with stress. But it's too much for tonight. So we'll go over seven of them. And uh, all of these ways or these methods have positive side effects for good health in addition to, to dealing with your stress. So they have other positive things for your health. And in the long run, they're going to improve your quality of life. They're going to improve your health, and they're going to decrease the negative effects of stress. So number one, the first one is adopt a healthy lifestyle. This is a general term, or this is a general way to deal with stress. But adopting a healthy lifestyle is the foundation to dealing with stress. This is the way we act. Are we physically active? This, is the way we, this incorporates the way that we eat. Are we eating regular healthy meals? Are we smoking, using alcohol, using drugs, using stimulants, you know, lots of lots of caffeine or energy drinks? We want to try to eliminate those. We want to do something to relax, have fun. Try to do, do something fun daily. 
You know, making a commitment to live a healthier lifestyle overall will help reduce your stress and give your body the advantage of coping or dealing with the negative effects of stress. So one of the day, ways of having a healthy lifestyle is getting adequate rest. The lack of sleep and inadequate rest is a strong stressor in itself. When you don't sleep enough, you're naturally like more stressed, right? You're naturally more jumpy. You're naturally more, you know, feisty. Sleep and rest are nature's ways of restoring the mind and the body. People who get seven to eight hours of sleep minimum each day handle stress much better and they're also more pleasant, easy, easier to get along with. So you want to rest long enough to relax your mind and your body. Another way to get good rest is by taking vacations. They recommend taking vacations twice a year at least. For many of us, that's very hard to do or we don't do it. But that's the recommendation. Um, when you're on rest and when you're on vacation, especially if you're in the outdoors, they allow you to catch up. They allow you to forget the daily activities of life. They allow you to get a break. And then when you come back, what happens? Well, how do you feel when you come back from vacation? You feel motivated, right? You have, hopefully, sometimes you come back from vacation and then you need to have a vacation from the vacation. <laughs> but if it was a good vacation or a relaxing vacation, you should come back motivated, refreshed. Usually you have a to-do list. OK, I got to do this, 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 right? You're, you're renewed. You have all the energy again. Um, maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Take a nap. Some people don't believe in taking naps, but take a nap. It, it doesn't have to be long. It can be short, 15, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Research shows that regular nap takers have fewer heart attacks and live longer than those who don't take naps. In many other countries, like at least they used to previously, like in Spain, they take a siesta, right? In Mexico, I don't know, some of these other countries, those that are possible, or at least they used to in the previous years, they used to have, a siesta, have siestas, a time in the day where they would just go lay down and take a nap. Even if you're not taking a nap, maybe just lay down on the couch for 10 minutes. If you're really stressed, if you're really tired, just you know, sit down, relax, listen to some relaxing music for 10, 15 minutes, and then you'll feel more refreshed. <laughs> Number two, this is very important. Sometimes we have a hard time doing this. Learn to say no. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling stressed, if you have too many responsibilities already, and someone else asks you to do something, you gotta learn to say no sometimes. It's not wrong to say no. You know, many times it might be very difficult, but we wanna be nice, we wanna help someone out, but we gotta learn to say no. We gotta learn when enough is enough. We don't wanna go over that limit to sacrifice our health for that. Especially people that ask for frequent favors. It's good to say no to them. <laughs> you know, you owe it to yourself, to your body, to your family, not to take on more tasks that you can do. And if you're overwhelmed, prioritize your commitments, prior prioritize your responsibilities. If you have to cancel something, cancel it. Don't overdo it. Do the important have-tos first. Then if you have the time, do the other tasks. So do the things that you need to do. And if you have time, do the other things. And also at home even, learn to delegate chores. Maybe to your husband, to your wife, to your children. Delegate at work. These are all very helpful things if you're feeling overwhelmed. Number three, be realistic. You know, sometimes we might set some goals for ourselves. We might shoot for the stars in the goals. You know, I just saw someone, a friend, like a 23-year-old friend on Facebook. He just put, I'm going to run for president. That's a good goal. You know, maybe he has good aspirations, but you got you to gotta be realistic. You know, before you set some of those goals, you know, do little things step by step. Don't over put your expectations too far. And then if that doesn't happen, be down on yourself, be depressed on yourself. You know, many, time, pe many times people find that life is filled with too many demands and too little time. For the most part, who chooses those demands? Who chooses the things that we have to do? We do. We take on the responsibilities. We might take on the responsibility of remodeling our house, 
we might be the one who decides to, you know, decide that, okay, I want to upgrade my car. Let me work a little ex another extra job so I can do that. So we've got to be realistic. Don't try to accomplish too much too soon, or you can burn out. Pace yourself. You know, the, the, one of the big recommendations is to set goals. You can set six months goals, yearly goals, five year, 10 year. And especially take a day at a time, one day at a time. Number four, simplify your life. That's what Marge was men mentioning. Keep it simple. Yeah. Get rid of clutter. Sorry, I jumped in. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you gave us a touch of it. You know, cut back on commitments, cut back on responsibilities if possible. You know, people might say, oh, it's hard for me to simplify my life. It's hard for me to do this. Because the problem is, oftentimes we try to get, we get into debt or we force ourselves to work extra to make extra money because we're trying to keep up with the Joneses, we're trying to keep up with the neighbor next door. We want, to get a, we want to get new clothes. We want to always go out to eat. We want to get a fancier home, a fancier car, right? And then what happens? You're working and working, working for that, and you don't have time to enjoy life. So instead of working all that extra for all of those things, why don't we manage our money better, and then we're going to be, we're going to be working less, we're going to be less, less stressed, and we're going to have more time, more time to enjoy life, more time to be with family, and actually enjoy the moment and not be caught up in the moment by working. And uh, you know, many times people find that they are happier and they enjoy life more if they slow down and simplify their lives. So peace of mind is worth more than a new car or a new home, isn't it? Number five, master one big change at a time. So if you have a major life event, as we were talking, they add up, right? Stress is additive. It builds on each other. You want to try to do one thing at a time. If you're going to get married, don't plan on starting a new job. You know, I have a new friend, I have, not a new friend, I have a friend in Washington, D.C. I was just visiting this last weekend, and he's getting married this summer. But he was looking for a new job. But that's a lot, you know, getting a new job, you've got to acclimate, and you've got to plan the wedding. Then on top of that, if you have to buy a new home, that's a lot, right? So just try to do one thing at a time. Plan one major thing at a time. Because the thing is, it's good for us to plan the major events that we can plan at a t one at a time because sometimes we'll have unexpected events that will happen. You might have a sickness, a death of a family member. You don't want to overdo it. And as we mentioned earlier, even too many good things, some of these things are great things, they can create stress. And then the bigger stress or the more stress you have, the harder it is to deal with it and cope with it. And if you're dealing with a lot of stress, if you're going through some major changes or some major stress stressors, take extra time to relax. Um, try to get more help, more support from family, from friends, and that will really help. Number six, learn to relax. Rela relaxation is the antidote to stress. So if, if you're going to take away, remember one thing from tonight, I want you to remember that relaxation is the antidote or the medicine to stress. Take frequent breaks. Take short breaks throughout the day. You can't be just going full speed, you know, 100 miles an hour all day. You have to take breaks. You have to allow your body to catch up, your mind to catch up. You know, sometimes at work, you might, I might be so, so busy, I don't even have time for lunch or time to sit down and do charting. It might be crazy, crazy busy outside on the floor. But if I go back to the break room and just sit down for a minute or two, have a snack, you come back out there and you feel more refreshed, more relaxed. Even if it's a minute or two, take a short break. If you're at work, go for a walk outside of the office. Or at home, go for a walk outside of your home. Five, ten minutes. You see the things outside, you forget about what you were doing for a second. Do what makes you feel relaxed. Um, do fun things you enjoy after work and on the weekends. Relaxation, since it's the antidote to stress, it can break the stress cycle. If you're in lots and lots of stress, relaxation can break that stress cycle. And when you become fully relaxed, the negative effects of stress, the high blood pressure, the dying early, the, high, the heart attacks, all of those negative effects are diminished, they're decreased, they're done away with. 
In fact, the positive emotions of peaceful, happy moments are health promoting and they should be enjoyed regularly. So this is something we want to do every day. Oftentimes we might you know, say, oh, let me just work, work, work really hard so I can finish this assignment. Then I'll go on a vacation or then I'll take a break on the weekend. But actually every day we should take little breaks, little times to relax, to do things we enjoy. And one of those ways can be going out in nature. You can go camping, going out in the fresh air. This is not only a good way to relax, this is a good way to bring your family closer together. You know, I used to like to, actually still do like to go backpacking and camping. I haven't done it recently. No time. This picture on the left here is my brother and I and a, and a brother from church in Southern California. We went backpacking. That was like 11 years ago. And the thing about camping, if any of you have been camping before, probably most of us have been, when you're camping, the air is so much fresher. I don't know about you, but I feel that I sleep better. And when I sleep, like I might sleep, you know, six, seven hours, but that time it feels like it's a better sleep, a better quality sleep. And when you're out in the open air, in the fresh air, breathing that fresh air, moving, hiking, what happens? You get hungrier. And then when you eat, how does the food taste out there when you're camping? Awesome. The food tastes better. So camping is a good way. Um, some other ways to break the stress and relax is um, take a warm bath. Listen to your favorite music. Watch a funny movie. Take a hike in the woods. Call a friend. Eat out. Take a nap. Play with your children. Enjoy a sunset. Relaxation counters everything bad that stress does to our bodies. So that's why it's very, very important. And what it does is if you've worn away your body, worn away your nerves by being stressed so much, when you relax, it helps restore that. So when you do these things that relax you, you're doing little miracles in your body that help you relax, and uh, especially if you do them regularly. So when was the last time some of you have done some of these things? Are you relaxing regularly? Are you taking the time to take a break, to enjoy life? Try to pick two or three, even one of them, one, some of the ones you most enjoy, and do them every day. It might be working in your garden. It might be you know, walking with a friend. It might be going out to eat. Whatever it is, try to do that. And you know, even with like, um, even at work, if you don't have time for a break, you can always you can always stretch. You can always you can always find a five five minute walk or time to sit down, breathe deeply. That that helps. Sometimes, you know, sometimes if we're stressed, what do we do? We may not remember to deep breathe, but our body naturally forces us to. What do you do? <sighs> right? Don't we do that? That's a that's a deep breath. That's deep breathing right there. So. Um, do things that relax you. What are some more ways to relax? There's tons of them. All up here. Pray, meditate, write in a diary, trim roses, read a good book, get a massage. The day before this lecture, I was not stressed, stressed, but I was a little, you know, a little anxious, a little stressed. So I went to the gym, worked out for a little bit, went to the sauna, the steam room. That's a great way to relax. It relaxes your muscles. You have that good eucalypt eucalyptus spray, and uh, that's a good way to relax. And number seven, this is very important, um, be physically active. Physical activity is like another antidote to stress. What was the, what was the main antidote to stress that we said? Relaxation. Relaxation. So the second one is physical activity. Physical activity relieves stress by... Um, Relieving pent-up emotions, it relaxes the muscles, it improves sleep. And what happens when you work out? What happens when you walk? You feel good, right? You have the release of the endorphins, which are the feel-good hormones in the body. It distracts you. It takes your mind off of the problems, off of the daily tasks. And then you can come back and have a clear mind and a fresh start. It improves your mood and it actually improves your resistance to stress. So if you exercise regularly, you'll be able to resist and deal with stress easier. How much physical activity should we get a day? Minimum. 30 minutes. The CDC recommends at least 30 minutes five times a week. Um, 
And not only that, physical activity gives you tons of other health benefits. Like we know it decreases your high, high blood pressure, right? It improves your, um, it increases your immune system. It improves your resistance to, to disease. It lowers your risks of heart attack, stroke. It's good for diabetes. So not only will it help your stress, you're going to get all these other positive benefits. The important thing is that we want to make physical activity a daily habit. Sometimes this is hard to do. If you're working, if you're just caught up in a routine, it's hard to do. It's hard to make it a daily habit. Um, but try to incorporate it into your day. For example, if you're going to the store, you, know, you don't have to always get the closest parking spot. You could park a little further and then get a good walk to the store. You know, do a few things. It might be five minutes here, 10 minutes there that add up. For example, if I work, I try to take the stairs, up eight flights of stairs. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's some good exercise. I take them up on the way, but uh, when I'm done with work, I'm too tired to take them down. <laughs> you, you would think it's easier coming down, but sometimes <laughs> when you're on your feet all day, it's, it's hard. But you know, do things that you can incorporate into your day that will help you increase your physical activity. It might be even at lunchtime if you're able to take a five minute walk, a 10 minute walk. You know, mow the lawn, work outside, walk the dog. All of these things are great. You can also play with your kids, find your neighbor's kids to play with, your friends. <laughs> kids always like to play and exercise, so that's one good way. What is one of the best types of exercise? <coughs> Walking. Now this is advice was from about 100 years ago, over 100 years ago, and it's still good for today. Um, this is from the book Councils on Health. It says, when the weather will permit, all who possibly can do so ought to walk in the open air every day, summer and winter. You get the benefits of exercise. You get the oxygen. A walk, even in the winter, would be more beneficial to health than all the medicine that the doctor may prescribe. So stress is reduced by physical activity. And we get many preventative side effects, or many preventative benefits of exercise when we exercise and uh, exercise regularly. Another way, this way has been great for me, is trust in God. Um, you know, there's that verse in Isaiah 40, 31 that says, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will fly on high wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. As I mentioned, I've been in school for eight years or more. And as I get older, it just gets more, more and more stressful and not necessarily more difficult. Yes, the difficult, it, it is more difficult, but it's just, you know, I'm, I'm sick of being in school. I'm sick of doing these assignments and papers over and over and over again. <laughs> so this has been one of the best methods for me to deal with stress. Trust in God. It's so nice when you can pray to God, tell him about your struggles and you, things you have to deal with, and ask him to help you. Then what happens? You don't have to worry. He will renew your strength, and you will um, run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint. I just want to mention a couple more. Um, actually, one of my favorite verses that helps me with stress and helps me make it sometimes is, uh, you know, that verse that says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the days the evil thereof. Basically, don't worry about tomorrow. Just worry about today. Take one day at a time. You know, you might think of, oh, I have to write this paper in two weeks. Oh, I better get started. Oh, but before that, I have to do, you know, I have to do these two tests this week. I've got to study for them. And then you think how I have to do this or that. And all of this stress adds up. But when you just take one day at a time, there's something about one day at a time. We have, God gives us enough strength to make it for each day. And um, there's that other famous verse written by King Solomon about being cheerful. It says, a merry heart or a cheerful heart. Being cheerful keeps you healthy. It slows death. It is a slow death to be gloomy all the time. Or another, the King James translation says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. And that's true. When you're happy, when you're cheerful, what happens? You're not stressed. So before we conclude, I'm just going to go over a couple more of these um, kind of funny, actually just one more depression joke about being happy and being cheerful. 
So a man goes to the doctor and he says he's depressed. He says that life seems hard and cruel. He says he feels all alone in a threatening world. He doesn't know what to do. The doctor says the treatment is simple. The great clown Terrafini is in town tonight. Go and see him. That should pick you up. The man bursts into tears. He said, but doctor, I am Terrafini. <laughs> so the great clown, the great clown who should pick you up, who should you know, make you laugh, who should you know, make you cry to tears from laughter, this was the man who was in trouble, who needed help, who felt all alone, who was so depressed, who felt that he was in a threatening world. You know, sometimes the people that you think actually aren't stressed are, or depressed, or worried, they are. All of us experience it. So in summary, um, plan time to relax daily. Try to make a schedule. Take time to have fun. You might not think you have time, but if you take time to have fun or to relax, then what's going to happen is when you go back to your work or to your studying or whatever you have to do, you're going to be more productive. Take time for yourself. Learn to accept yourself as who you are. Replace guilt with forgiveness and trust. Maintain a positive outlook and be optimistic. So these are proven stress reducers. And you can make a list of your own. You can make a list of the things that work for you. As I mentioned, I found over 20 things that are proven by science to reduce and decrease stress. We only went over seven of them tonight. For you, you know what things help you. You know what things make you feel better. Try to do them. Try to deal with the cause of the stress. And um, learn to laugh at yourself. Learn to laugh at life. Learn to deal with stress. Develop good friends. Have hope for the future. Look for the best in everyone. And most importantly, trust in God. So just to review really quick, we'll just go over some quick review questions. True or false, stress can be beneficial or destructive? True. True. It can be both. True or false, stress is caused by difficult people and difficult situations? Sometimes. <laughs> false. That's actually false. Stress is internal. What happens? We allow ourselves to become stressed by the difficult people and the difficult situations. Sure, there are difficult people. There are difficult situations. But we're the ones who allow ourselves to be stressed by that. What are three effective strategies when feeling overwhelmed? All of those. <laughs> Relax, delegate, prayer, exercise. How about saying no? Yeah. <laughs> Setting priorities and yeah, learning to delegate. Number four, true or false, change, even good changes can be stressful. True. That's true. And what is the best antidote for stress, the best medicine for stress? Relaxation. And probably the second is physical activity. True or false, physical activity is a good stress releaser. True. true. True or false, isolating yourself is a good way to deal with stress. False. false. Some people say, I just got to be alone. I just got to have some time. You know, let me just, give me some time. Give me a break. Give me a breather, right? <laughs> but that's false. That's not a good way. You want to get help. You want to go to your support group. You want to go to friends. You want to go to God. You don't want to lock yourself into the room. That's not going to help. So thank you all for your attention this evening. Does anyone have any questions or comments? before we have a little demonstration on some, we're going to have a couple cookies and some relaxing tea. Any questions, comments? No? Thank you all. I was trying to think what to share with you, and so I thought to share some cookies. So I had a little bit of stress because I'm on this 10-day cleanse. On the first day of my cleanse, I had to make cookies. And on the second day of my cleanse, I had to make cookies and not to have any. I had small, one or two only. So that was a little stress. But um, I have two cookies. Um, I will show you the coconut macaroons because they're so easy and so quick. And basically, we're going to take... I was, I was making juice, 
and I was thinking, what can I do with the carrots? I remember we showed you like about two, three weeks ago, uh, two or three months ago maybe, this patty from the leftovers from the juicing. Okay, well, this is something else you can do from leftovers from juicing. You can make these uh, coconut macaroon cookies. And you take one cup of packed grated carrots, and then we're gonna add I'm going to leave the honey for uh, water for later. We're going to add coconut, about a cup and a half of coconut, no, two and a half cups of shredded coconut, and this is unsweetened coconut. And to that, we're going to add about half a cup of whole wheat pastry flour and a teaspoon of almond extract and a little bit of salt and honey and that's it it couldn't be easier it couldn't be easier and i like easy recipes don't you and healthy recipes could someone get me a some um, gloves, please. I always loved coconut macaroons, and I've always planned to make them, but never took the time. So this is a good time to do it. And the nice thing about this recipe is that it has no eggs, it has no cholesterol, it has no milk, butter, butter <laughs> or, oil, yeah. or oil. So you have, um, you're using your carrots from your juice. I mean, it couldn't be better. Actually, why am I doing this by hand? I forgot why I brought this for. It's for here. Yes. Thank you. You just put it in your food processor for a minute or less until it's kind of nicely ground. And it's an easy way to do it. Now the other recipe, you can't put it in the processor because you don't want the sunflower seeds to be broken up. But I did use a um, I did use a like a cookie kind of little blend of what do you call that a mixer, yeah. Yeah, this needs a little bit of water. You kind of have to see, not as much as a quarter, because you don't want it too wet. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think this is good. We won't need any more. Thank you. So this is already finished. Was that quick or not? Now the fun part is making the little balls. And I didn't have, when I made my cookies at home, I didn't have a small um, ice cream scooper, but I found one here. Actually, I had a one eighth of a teaspoon measuring cup, so that's what I used. But this will be nicer. The way they make them, it's kind of, you don't make it flat like a cookie, but you make it like a mound. So I will just make a few to show you how it goes. Now this, this is not the best, 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 uh, 
ice cream scooper because it makes a little thing on the top. But anyway. And these are the sesame ones. Now these are really good because they have, uh, I think they have tryptophan, which is good to make your serotonin, which is a precursor for serotonin, which is good to help with depression and dealing with stress. It's, it's your happy hormone. So that's why I chose this one. Which of the ones provides you with the tryptophan? The tryptophan, the sesame seed. Oh, it's the sesame. So basically, it's sesame fingers. I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to make this. Actually, we, when we had a health food store, people used to like this. We used to make it. So it's only a cup and a half of uh, raw sesame seeds, three quarters cup of fine unsweetened coconut, a half a cup of natural peanut butter, which means only peanuts and salt no oil added, no sugar added, okay? Quarter cup of honey, actually I put half a cup of honey and no sugar, but you can do quarter cup of honey, quarter cup of brown sugar, teaspoon vanilla, half a teaspoon salt, and finely chopped walnuts. And you mix it all up with your little hand mixer. And you preheat your oven to 300, and you can put it you know, spread it. It's a little hard to spread, but you just kind of take one chunk of it at a time and spread it all around and then um, bake it for about 20 minutes. It depends on your oven. The recipe called for 30 minutes, but I almost burned some of them. So it's more like 20 minutes and keep on watching it. When, once it started getting brown, you, you want to make sure you don't overbake it. You take it out. And the key is that you, as soon as you take it out of the oven, to cut it. Uh, immediately and w once you have cut it let it sit there till it gets firm because they're not firm right away and then you can um, then you can you know let them cool and then you can have them to eat <laughs>